We welcome you with us today. We've got an unusual situation. We're meeting in a different room. Uh, this is the Curtis Hudson Chapel, named for Dr. Curtis Hudson, who's now with the Lord. We have a lot of meetings in here, in this chapel. Every week there are meetings in here. It's not the place where we come to worship, but a lot of auxiliary type meetings take place here. But we have an unusual group here today, uh, along with you who are joining us on the Zoom call. We have young men who are here visiting with us for a little while who believe God's got a call on their lives, and we're thankful for that. I'm going to introduce some things to them, and we're, we're going to pray for them and ask God to guide them and help them. Um, some of you, we're going to keep you going here, not get stuck on any one person, but um, we're taking care of that, right? Very good. But anyway, I want to pray with you, just like we've prayed with this group. Let's pray together, may we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and mercy. We thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity to share our heart with others. Guide us by your Spirit. May Christ be glorified in all we do. In his name we pray. Amen. Now, I'm not necessarily going to see you on the screen in front of me, which is a monitor. I'll see myself on that. But I will say to all of you who are joining us, we're glad to have you, but we're going to see some of your faces on the screen behind me. And good to see all of you. God bless you. And uh, just thrilled at what God is doing. I'm going to give some information to the young men who are here. And uh, one of the things I'm going to talk about, I need to see myself here on the front. Uh, one of the things I'm going to talk about is making sure that you have the information accessible, available to you, and I hope you'll do that. Remember, you can email us for anything you wish to have, and so we'll make it accessible to you. I have in my hand something entitled Evangelizing the Small Towns of America and starting with what we want to do beginning with God. And um, I sent an email out to you, God's army invades small town America. And that's what we want to do. Have the invasion of small town America. And so may God help us with all of this. Uh, Ryan, are we get it, getting it here? Very good. Thank you, sir. Good. So what I'm going to talk about today will be accessible to you or any of the other things I'm talking about will be accessible to you that are watching and listening. And I've got an audience here. Uh, I maybe get a little, a little shot of some of these young men. It's one, it's one of a great group of young men uh, who are joining us today here in the Curtis Hudson Chapel. And we're so, so thankful to God for them. So very thankful to God for them. That's a wonderful thing. Wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, we're enlisting people to serve the Lord, and we're putting an emphasis on evangelizing the small towns in America. And I've got a list of things I want to talk to you about. And so when you're listening, if you want this list, just email me, and I'll send it to you. Pastor at templebaptistchurch.com. We're happy to get it to you. When we're evangelizing the small towns in America, we have to begin with the right view of God if we're going to get it done. Begin with the right view of God. And this is a, a personal knowledge of who God is revealed in His Word. God's heart for fallen man, God's desire to call a people out for his name, and the miracle that God works through Holy Spirit power when the gospel is given. 
So it all begins that way. And I'm going to give you a list of things. We're taking very seriously the idea of evangelizing the small towns in America. And so may God guide us and help us with all of this. We have to have not only a right view of God, but a right view of God's work. And God's work must be understood. The mission we're on is a, the Lord's mission. We're on the mission with Him. He has not been defeated. He's not retreated. He's always working. He's always advancing. And it can't be confined to just a certain group of people because God said go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So that's God's work. And we're trying to do God's work God's way. The third thing I say by introduction is a right view of pastors and churches. We have a, a renewed emphasis on what the church is, what a pastor is. We're to be obedient to his command. We're to join the Lord in the work he is doing. And we are his body through whom he works. His mission advances only as we obey and move forward by faith. So that's what we're doing. Moving forward by faith. Now, I'm going to give you seven things to write down. But before I do, I'm going to tell you that we're creating through our Baptist friends an advance of New Testament church pioneer workers. As a matter of fact, God is raising up an army, an army of young men and women, an army of men and women who are not so young, but men and women who are to teach the Bible and preach the Bible and be enlisted in God's work to do it God's way. So it's like this. We need to say again with an emphasis, this is what God's given us to do and the way God wants it done. And so may the Lord help us with all of this. So let's write it down. Number one, the pastor is called of God. It starts with the pastor. Having the right view of God, the right view of God's work, and the right view of the local church. Someone has to embody this. And we believe that it needs to be embodied by the preacher, and in particular, the pastor. So God uses people. He raises up people to accomplish his work. And he wants to raise you up. He wants to use you. And we're putting emphasis on evangelizing the small towns in America. And 75% of American population lives in the small towns. And we can have an invading army going into small towns led by pastors and leaders who want to get the gospel to people there. So we, we say we take for granted these things, the right view of God, right view of God's work, and the right view of a pastor in churches. But the pastor is called of God. Number two, the people are led by the pastor. We need leadership. And every shepherd is a leader. Not every leader is a shepherd. But God has called us to lead. And we're to lead the people. The people have to be led and the pastor has to know how to lead them. And we begin leading like Jesus began leading. I've written this out for you. There's an inner circle of workers sometimes deacons, leaders, and we work through that inner circle. The Lord Jesus Christ came from heaven, became a man without ceasing to be God, and at the appropriate moment called people to be with him and provided the leadership they needed. That leadership was not only taught, it was caught from him. They got his passion and his purpose and it can be done. 
May God help us to see that. The people are going to be used of God as they're following the preaching and teaching of God's man. Learn how to express this to your people. Learn how to share these things with your people. The resources that we provide for you can be used and there are resources developed. I brought some things I'm going to share with these young men who have been believing in their heart that God's put them in the ministry. I have a paper I'm going to give them on preparing to preach the Bible. You may want this if you're listening on the Zoom call today. Preaching begins with God. We are to be more concerned about what people think about God than what people think about us. And so the paper is all about the call of God on your life and preparing to preach. I have something I'm going to share with them on things that accompany salvation. We have salvation, but there are things that accompany salvation, that come along with salvation. I have a list of 30 things here. For instance, when we come to know the Lord Jesus as our Savior, we, we have received from God a heavenly citizenship. We've been made a gift from God the Father to God the Son. And on the list goes 30 different things and Bible verses for each of those things. I want to commend this to these young men, but encourage them not only to know this, but to memorize these verses. Then if you're going to be talking all your life about God calling you to do something, you need to explain what you mean by that. Has God called you? What does that mean? If I said to you, has God called you, what would you say? Yes. And then someone expects you to explain to them what that meant, that God has called you. I want to give you some things to help you understand the call of God on your life. I've written here the first sign of the heavenly call is an intense, all-absorbing desire for the work of God. In order for there to be a true call to the ministry, there must be an irresistible, overwhelming, craving and raging thirst for telling to others what God has done in your own soul. And that thirst builds, it enlarges, it increases. But there's page after page of things here about what Charles Purchin said about the call to preach, about what John Newton said about the call to preach. And but I have it. When I was just a young preacher starting out, I came across some people who helped me greatly. One of those people was a man by the name of Vance Havner. I spent a week with Vance Havner on one occasion, another week on another occasion, walking through the woods and listening to him talk. He had a, a, a righteous distraction listening to birds. He could name every bird in the uh, eastern United States. He knew their call. He knew what they looked like. And I said to Vance Havner, I said, I'm just a young preacher just starting out in the ministry. What advice would you give me? And he said, there are certain books you should read. And he mentioned an author by the name of Richard Ellsworth Day. He said, read Ellsworth Day's biography of Charles Spurgeon and read Ellsworth Day's biography of D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody was called Bush of Glow and Charles Spurgeon was the shadow of the broad brim. And Richard Ellsworth Day was a, a biographical author years and years ago. And I remember Van Sabner saying, if you read those biographies, you'll feel like you're walking with those men. And when you're walking with those men, it seems like you're in, in the period of the apostles. Well, I took him for granted and got the books, read the biographies. And then I began to build a book list. I'm giving these young men who are with us here this book list and the Pastors and Christian Workers book list. I've compiled this for over 40 years 
But you may wish to have a copy of that. I'd be glad to send you one. But I'm giving these boys this book list today. I was preaching in a special meeting in Washington, D.C., looking for God's mind about the message. And I just landed on the thought of the people of God from 1 Peter, the people of God. And I just went through my Bible and wrote down about 40 things that characterize the people of God. That's how it all began. And that message became this little book on the people of God. I'm giving this book to these young men. But you may wish to get this because that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to use the things God's given you and apply to your life and ministry what God's people can do, what God can do through his people. And for years I've been trying to help young people know the mind of God about their life and life decisions. So I wrote a little book called What to Look For in a Life's Mate. Not to look for a life's mate, but what to look for in a life's mate. Years ago, I guess it's been 30 years ago, I heard Dr. Stephen Alford bring a message on how Adam went to sleep in the will of God and awoke to what God had given him. He provided for him his helpmeet, Eve. And he trusted the Lord to provide her to him. And Dr. Alford talked about young men and young women going to sleep in Jesus, meaning that you don't just spend your life trying to hunt down a woman or hunt down a man. You trust the Lord to bring people across your path and help you understand who you're going to spend your life with. What is it God wants? Because nothing will be more important in your life after your salvation than the person you decide you're going to marry. And you want to be equally yoked, not unequally yoked, but equally yoked, meaning have the same love for the Lord, a mutual love for the Lord Jesus, a mutual respect for God's people and God's work. And on it goes. So I wrote this little book. I went through the book of Proverbs, and I took about 40 things from Proverbs on what you should look for in a life's mate. Not looking for a life's mate, but these ought to be obvious things you see in the life of somebody before you give your heart to them. You should never give your heart to anyone unless that person has given his or her heart to the Lord. So you may want to get this book for young people or people not so young who are still not married. You may want to get it and just read it to help you in your own marriage because these are things that ought to be true in every marriage and a life's mate. But I want you to have it. I'm just talking about resources. Years ago, I got this statement from what Charles Spurgeon had written on what a Baptist is. People have lost sight of that. And I put it on a card like this you can use. As a matter of fact, I put famous Baptists around it. And uh, through the centuries, people who have taken a strong stand for the Lord. And I, I became a Baptist by conviction. I believe that what Baptists believe is the Bible. And if the Bible says it, that's what Baptists believe. It's a very, very simple matter. Uh, the Bible is the final authority and the full authority for our faith and practice. Spurgeon believed that, and he put it in words. Sometimes people say, I believe it, but they can't put it in words. And so on the back side of this, there's a little outline I've given on the man of vision and the man of ambition. I want each of these young men to have that because I want you to be a man of vision. And the vision comes from God. It's how we see the Lord. People say sometimes to me, uh, Clarence Sexton, you're a man of vision. But the truth is, they don't even understand what vision is. It doesn't mean you're trying to do a lot of things. You see things the way God sees it. That's what you want. You want, you want the mind of God. You want God's mind and thoughts about particular things. And so I'm going to give all these young men this, and you may want to, want to get that from me. Here's, here's a little thing I'm putting in a book uh, I've written two books on the life of David. But this is a, a lecture I gave 
and I want them to have it on how God makes a man, the making of the man of God. What does God do? What ingredients does God put in your life to help you become the man God wants you to become? And you see, there are two types of preparation. There's deliberate preparation. Those are things that you choose to do. Uh, when I answered God's call to preach in the ministry, my pastor, Dillard Hagen, said to me, if God's really called you, a call to preach is a call to prepare. So immediately I took that for granted. And I, I wanted to start preparing to do what God wanted me to do with my life. And there are deliberate decisions I made. I went to college. I finished a junior college, went to university, finished college, went to seminary after that because I felt like that I had to, to prepare choices to make. But there's another type of preparation that you have no control over. That's divine providence. Those are the things God allows you to go through and, and allows you to deal with in your life uh, that builds things into you. And I want you to understand that. That's what we find in the life of David in the making of the man of God, how the Lord prepared his life for what he had prepared him to do. I was born to Preston Sexton, who was 22 years older than my mother. My mother's name uh, was Ruby. They're both with the Lord now. But I was the oldest of four children. Providential, that's the place God put me. You may be the baby of the family. You may be the middle child of the family. But I've been able to see how God allowed me to learn some things from that. And then what God allowed my family to go through. The fact of the matter is, uh, we lived in 19 different places before I was in the third grade. And I went to two schools in the, in the first grade didn't even go to school in the second grade. Well, why did God let those things happen to me? I don't mean you have to have somebody else's experience, but I mean by that, that God is teaching you in your experience. Some of you had the death of a parent early in life. Why did God allow that? You had no control over it, but God let you go through it. So there's deliberate preparation that you do. You do the best you can at that. Then there's the preparation of divine providence. And that's how you see God's hand. And you see the harmony of both those things. How the Lord works that out. And I hope you see God's hand in it. Years ago, some young men asked me if I would do something about the preparation and delivery of a sermon. And this is the chapter from a book on preaching. I'm going to give all of these young men this preparation and delivery of a sermon and uh, it's put in magazine form and I think it will help them. But you can get that and I want you to have it. Uh, I have here also uh, some information on 50 years of ministry. Now, I don't think anybody talked to me about this when I was a boy starting out. But when I came to the Lord and I surrendered my life to serve the Lord, I said, I'm going to serve God with all of my life. I meant it. I could have been distracted, blown off course, but by the grace of God, that hasn't happened. I've been now a preacher of the gospel for 55 years. If early on in my life I said, this is what I want in my life, these are the things I'd want to do in my life, uh, some choices I made, but other choices God made for me, as I mentioned a moment ago. But we've got a, a sort of a summary of my life for 50 years in this little magazine that was prepared for me, continuing the things that God has taught me and knowing who's taught me. And I want all these young men to have a copy of this. But I'd be glad to send any of you who are in this Shepherd Summit a copy of this 50 years of ministry, uh, speaking the truth in love. But what I'm saying to you is on this, on this second point, if we're really getting down to business and going to evangelize the small towns of America, 
the pastor is going to have to lead the people to do that. You think what it would be like if we had an invasion from heaven, an invasion of men and women taking on the small towns of America to get the gospel to people. That's what we need to be like an invading army and doing. It's, it's, it's the ground God's given us. And we need to take that ground for the glory of God. May the Lord help us. And we're incorporating that in our, in our Baptist Friends meeting. And the New Testament church pioneers will be doing that. And we'll have young men and women who enlisted to, to do this invading in these small towns with the gospel. And we're on a mission from God and with God. And that's what it's all about. The third thing I want you to write down is spiritual understanding comes from the Holy Spirit. We have to have a spiritual understanding. And the battle always is with the world, the flesh, and the devil. Really battling. Is this what God wants or is this what I want? And the Holy Spirit gives people the right view of God, and the right view of the church, and the right view of God's work. But don't discount this. It is the Lord leading us and leaning on the Holy Spirit that we need. You see, you may have a man who says, I'm going into banking, and he goes to a famous school to learn about banking. Or you may have a man say, I'm going to be an engineer, a structural or architectural engineer, whatever the case may be, and he gets the training for that. You cannot be what God wants you to be without the instruction and leading and understanding given by the Holy Spirit. You either know him or you don't know him. You either lean on him or you don't lean on him. And you say, well, how young do I have to be or how old do I have to be? It doesn't matter what age. The Lord comes to live in you once you've been born again, and now he wants you to yield all of your life to him. And so the spiritual understanding you need comes from the Holy Spirit. Number four, the burden is inescapable. I mean by that, you need to know the difference between a burden and what is not a burden. Something God puts in your heart to do. How do you, how do you recognize that? How do you begin to pray about it? When I went to Greenback Memorial Baptist Church in Greenback, Tennessee, I was just a kid. I wasn't old enough to vote, but I was called to be the pastor of the Greenback Memorial Baptist Church in Greenback, Tennessee. They just recently had me back down there to preach, and that's not the first time I've been back, but I was there over 50 years ago. But that little village became my village. That town became my town. And... I felt like it was my responsibility to get the gospel to everybody there. And I worked at it. My wife and I worked together at it. And so the burden comes upon you. It's inescapable. Did you ever do anything in your life that you think, I have to do this? You know, Tim, you went to Venezuela. Did you go under the call of God? How did you? How did you know? Yeah. I traveled to different countries from our church on mission trips and things in the Middle East and to Europe and to North America, Canada, and in Venezuela when I was there, uh, I was taken back by the fact that uh, I was with a Spanish-speaking man, and I was taken back by the fact that the people, no one had ever shared with them the gospel. On one account, I was standing on the sidewalk in the bank was opening. There was probably 100 people in, in the line. We went to each person. I asked the interpreter, ask them if anyone had ever shared with them what I just told them, and they said no. God broke my heart, and that was a beginning point. I traveled back six times. There were 28 well, we, uh, churches like our church there in the country. There was a great need, and God just confirmed that. God gave me a, a desire to do that. I had a burden I, I saw the need, but it was more than the need. Well, it began it with God, what God did in my heart. Is yes. it something you felt like you had to do? 
oh, I had to do it. I went back six times. Matter of fact, the, the two days after I got back, I bought my plane ticket and uh, had to tell you I was going back <laughs> that week. But uh, yes, I had to go. It was a compulsion within me, a divine compulsion that God put. It was from God. It wasn't just seeing the need there, poverty, lack of uh, the gospel advance, that people were going to hell. It was something that God was like, you need to go do this. And God confirmed it step by step along the way, uh, usually in the first converts. My first person I led to the Lord, uh, he actually texted me this morning. That was 20-some years ago. And he's in Brazil, but he has a burden to go back to a small town in the mountains of Venezuela and preach the gospel. And so God just keeps confirming things. You followed me. And, of course, God did the work. But the Bible says in Philippians 2.13, it's Lord that worketh in you both to will and, and to, to do of his good pleasure. Amen. Let me ask this question. Do you know, do you think it's possible that these men who are listening and these young men who are here with us today could get such a passion, such a burden, that they would know, surely know this is God's direction? Uh, C.T. Yeah. Stud said, the, more cl the closer you get to God, the more intensely missionary you become. Only when you get close to God and truly worship him will you have a passion for what he wants. Anything else is just your idea. We're trying to evangelize the, the country of England and from beyond. And um, how, does, how does a young man interested in himself, interested in what he wants to do, interested in his own desires, get all that transferred to where he's got a passion to do something for God? Well, I think it all comes back to draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. And if our heart's desire is to please the Lord Jesus Christ, to live for Him, to be filled day by day with the Holy Spirit, then God puts within your heart a desire to do His will. And then He gives that intense desire, like Pastor Sexton is speaking about, where all of the things of the world, as the old hymn says, fade away. And the things that once were so attractive, fame, fortune, what I wanted to do now seems very unappealing and what God wants me to do is something that my heart is racing after that's what my desire is now and so we can never know God's will in what to do before we really come close to Christ himself in Mark chapter 3 the Lord Jesus called his apostles and he called them if you read chapter 3 verses 13 and 14 it tells us that he sent them forth to preach that was what they were to do but before they were to do something the Bible tells us they were to be something. They were to be with Him. The first call on our life is not to a geographic location or a vocation. The first call in a Christian's life is a, a call to be with Jesus Christ. And if I'm with Jesus Christ, He knows where to send me. He knows what I should do. Well, would you agree or disagree with me that we're trying to do a lot of things we call the work of God without that passion, without that holy unction. And um, I mean, there have been things in my life where I didn't have to be motivated. I mean, it's, the fact is I was already motivated to get, get it done. So it's this inescapable burden. You can get it. God can put it on you. The fifth thing I want you to write down is the pastor and people move forward by faith. And not feeling, sometimes you don't have the feeling. They see other churches doing things or other people doing things and that can motivate you somewhat. But you move forward by faith. You know this is what God wants done, where he wants it done, when he wants it done, how he wants it done, and you move forward by faith. And we, we just keep pressing away. I mean, when my pastor, who was such a wise man, I, I need to write a little book on the wisdom of Dillard Hagen. I really do. Because I, I think of things all the time. He said to me, when I was very young, like many of the boys in this group, and I was very young, and he imparted wisdom to me. 
But he said to me when I started preaching, he said, you don't preach by inspiration. You preach by perspiration. And that, I mean, I thought, what in the world is he talking about? He said, there are times you don't feel like doing it. There are times you don't feel like studying. But it leads to a disciplined life where you do it when you don't feel like doing it. But it has to be done. But you keep looking to God, trusting God, believing God, moving forward by faith. A sixth thing I want you to write down is the people must be trained and equipped. This is always the case. The Lord Jesus Christ gave us the greatest example. Sometime in your life you need to read uh, the training of the twelve. The training of the twelve. It's a classic book, been around for a hundred years or more. But is is how Jesus trained his disciples. How he trained them to pray. How he trained them to preach. The training of the twelve. You can't have God's work without training. And so the people must be trained and equipped. Equipped. That's why I've put an emphasis on all this material and putting it into print. That's why I have pastors' colleges, and that's why I put things in people's hands. And because I, I want them to be trained and equipped to do God's work. And we talk about less wonderful things we're going to do. This is wonderful things we're going to do. This is wonderful things. Let's evangelize the small towns in America. We have a, a, a mission on right now for evangelizing one of the small towns in America. And it's a town that people hear about all the time. We just had somebody go there that's very precious to us. And uh, some people call it the jumping off place. But in Key West, Florida, there's a town of about 30,000 people that needs to be evangelized. And we say... Let's evangelize that town. Well, that's a good idea. But it becomes more than an idea when we start training and equipping people to do it. That has to be done. I have a message I've given on New Testament church pioneers. I was influenced greatly by uh, a man by the name of A.B. Simpson. A.B. Simpson uh, was not a contemporary for any of us. He was a contemporary of D.L. Moody, lived over 100 years ago. But God used him in a mighty way. He was a Presbyterian. He got tired of the Presbyterian church not being evangelistic, and he started his own group, Christian Missionary Alliance. And, um, but he felt like there was a place for everybody to be trained, something every person could do in God's work. And he used a lot of wisdom in that. There are people who who printed material. There are people who gave sacrificially, and on it goes. You can read my message, and I, I credit Simpson in the introduction of that, and I think that's the only legitimate thing to do. But you can't get it done without training. You see, there are many people who felt like, well, I, 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 I got something on my heart to do, but where does Crown College come in? Where, where does, well, Crown College is to train people to serve the Lord. That's what we're given to, training people to serve the Lord. And we, we, think, we think, well, what about they, what they have to do? Well, there ought to be a lot of discipline, a lot of sacrifice involved in that. As a matter of fact, I'm starting something to enlist people to a greater life of sacrifice and devotion. And that's, that's what we need to do. May God help us. It can't be done without training and equipping. Then the seventh thing I have you write down is we, we witness God at work as we obey Him with the gospel. I'm not talking about my work. I'm not talking about doing my work. I'm talking about witnessing God at work as we obey Him with the gospel. You see... How many of us have been inspired and encouraged by someone's story about what the Lord did? We, we hear them talk about the great thing God accomplished. Well, you know why? 
You know why they can talk about it? Because they saw it. They were involved in it. And so you're just starting out, many of you. And the fact of the matter is, you're never going to see what God can do. You're never going to be the witness of his great work unless you obey him with the gospel and you'll see God break through and do things. You'll see the Lord prove himself and again and again. As a matter of fact, <laughs> as a matter of fact, you'll stand sometimes and to your own amazement, you'll be thrilled to your own amazement at how God provided. And I've, I've seen a lifetime of this. Sometimes I think my life is, must, I'm 73 years old, how much more can I live? I have a boy that prays for me every Sunday for me to live 50 more years. I said, dear Lord, boy, I'm going to be the oldest preacher that ever lived if I live 50 more years. But I, I know what it's like. I know what it's like to trust God. The first camp we bought, um, the first camp we bought, we looked for everywhere for a camp to train young people. And we didn't have the name for it, but we knew we wanted to camp. And we, we had just enough to make the down payment. And, and God broke to improve himself. And now thousands of young people have been reached in that one camp. Uh, a camp in Texas God gave us. Um, I walked on the property in um, Heron, Montana for the Monarch School. It was bankrupt. They charged $1,000 a week to go to it. And it was bankrupt. You imagine somebody couldn't make it happen when they were charging $1,000 a week they couldn't make it happen. When I walked on that property, I said, this belongs to us. My wife was with me. It scared her to death. Honestly, it scared her to death. She said, I know you. Now you believe this is what God wants. I said, yes, I know the Lord wants us to have it. And they said, well, they only want $4.7 million for it. And they got down to $1.4 million. But I didn't have $14 or 14 cents. But now we own the camp. What, what do you say? Not how great we are. We, we followed the Lord and he, we have a story to tell about how God broke through and did something. And now amazing stories about how God's proved himself over and over there. And one case after another in the work in England and, and with Crown Hall. and Oh, it's just thrilling what the Lord does. You're never going to see that. You're never going to see it. You're going to read about it. You're going to hear somebody else talk about it unless you trust God for yourself on these things. So I say we're going to evangelize the small towns in America. We're going to take the small towns in America, 5,000, 10,000, Key West, Florida, 30,000 people, and say, where are the laborers? God has the laborers. We pray the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. But we'll see it. We will see van loads and car loads of people going there, knocking on doors, winning people to Christ because God gave us the mind and heart and burden to do it and he accompanies us by himself being with us and proves himself how, how we would do things. We just got to step out on faith and do it. So let me give you these seven things again. Make sure you have them written down. If we're going to evangelize the small towns in America, we've got to get the right view of God, the right view of God's work, and the right view of pastors and churches. Then number one, the pastor is called of God. That's something else we've neglected. We just think people can be volunteer to do that. But there's a divine calling. Get the information I've written here on the call of God and see if God's put this call on your life. Has he called you? I know God has called me. I volunteer. I want to serve the Lord, but I know God has called me. Then number two, the people are led by the pastor. You know the pastor's doing his work because there's people following him. 
And he loves the sheep. He gives his life for them. And there's some evidence in all of this. Number three, spiritual understanding comes from the Holy Spirit. You can't do God's work without the Holy Spirit. And we have to have the Holy Spirit working in us and through us and with us. And we see miracle things that he does. The burden is inescapable, number four. The burden is inescapable. Why did you get a passion for something? You say, well, what about preaching or whatever? I'm saying the burden is inescapable. You can do it without a burden. You can do it without God. You can do it without passion. But you're going to flounder. It's never going to work. And it comes from your acquaintance with the Lord and knowing the Lord. And number five, the pastor and people move forward by faith. There will never be a time faith is not required. Never. And if it's not by faith, it won't please him. And then the sixth thing, the people must be trained and equipped. The seventh thing, which is a circle that comes back around us. We witness God at work as we obey him with the gospel. And the Lord just keeps proving himself again and again and again. Now, I have some questions that these young men have put to me. Can you imagine these young men putting questions out? And so I've got other folks, scores of people around the country listening to these questions. So I'm just going to take a few of them and see what, what we can do. Now, question number one, uh, do, you have, do you have have to have points in a sermon? Well, a sermon message that you're giving to people, there's, there's some things I, I would say about points. But the question, I'm just answering the question, you're giving the, the lister something to hold on to, something he can wrap his thoughts around. Most of my sermons are simple. They, they have an introduction. The introduction has uh, an expression of what the context of the scripture is about. And then each point comes from that until finally its conclusion and invitation is given. But you don't have to have points. But you won't, you won't get far unless you have some logic in your sermon. Another question, how long should you spend preparing for the sermon? I've been preaching 55 years, and some sermons I'm preparing longer than that. I mean, longer than I've been called. Before I ever called, God, God was working in my heart about things. So some sermons you'll preach some thought God gives you in 20 minutes you, you're preaching it I know one time Frank Sells said he was a spiritual father and Frank Sells said when he was preaching through the book of Jonah he said who cast Jonah in the sea and I thought what a strange question who cast Jonah in the sea well I thought about that and he showed me from chapter 1 that the sailors cast Jonah in the sea and showed, showed me from the Bible in chapter 2 that Jonah said God cast him in the sea. So I thought, I'm going to preach on that. Who did cast Jonah in the sea? And I pondered that and thought on it and thought on it and thought on it. And God gave me illustrations. And it may have taken, it may have taken two or three hours to get the thoughts together, but it took years to put it together. Another question. How do you discern between your will and God's will? That's the hardest thing you'll ever do in your life. What, what does God want? What do you want? And then sometimes what God wants and what you want is the same thing. And when you want something God doesn't want, it's hard to get rid of it. Uh, there's a harmony between that. Uh, how can we study books of the Bible written specifically to Jews or Gentiles? That's a strange question, but I'm going to try to answer it. The Bible is for all people. All 66 books of the Bible. There are five books 
the Pentateuch books written for the Jewish people and God's sovereign work with his people. There are 12 historical books talking about what God did with his people. There are personal books dealing with the great heart of God. Um, there are major prophets and minor prophets. When you read the gospel records, you have four gospel records, one gospel. You have the book of Acts, the Acts of the, of the Holy Spirit. You have nine Christian church epistles, four pastoral or personal epistles, nine Hebrew Christian church epistles. The last nine books of the Old Testament were all written for Jewish people, but they're all for all of us. So I don't let anything take some of the Bible from you. It's all for you. It's all for you. Maybe not all written to you, but it's all for you. How can I strengthen my devotional life? By being devotional. Uh, having devotions is one thing. Having a devotional life is another thing. Uh, meditation is something that's been lost. and But you've got to have something to meditate on. And that's the Word of God. How do you prepare a sermon or what are some of the things that you think would help a young man in preparing a sermon? Well, getting a sermon, getting a sermon on a specific topic can be something you choose or God chooses. It could be something that arises that needs to be dealt with. If somebody was talking to me about how terrible it is for people to tattoo their bodies, and I, and I said, well, whose body is your body? Whose body is your body? Is your body the temple of the Lord? Then what right do you have to mark it all up if it belongs to God? So you, you have to start dealing with whose body is your body and what does the Bible say about that? Uh, there's mis different ways to approach that. And um, do you have a verse or verses in particular that have helped you through while serving in the ministry all these years. Well, I took a life verse in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Then I got to struggling so in ministry that I took another verse, Acts chapter 5, verse 42, and, and the verse was talking about can just doing this, you know, ceasing not. Don't don't quit. Then I came to another verse in Second Timothy chapter three, verse fourteen. But continue thou the things which thou hast learned has been assured of, knowing whom thou hast learned them. So I don't know if one verse. There are verses that that see you through, but God speaks to you about different things at different times. Whatever God called you away to a different church, a different city, did you fight God? Well, I've always wrestled with that kind of thing. I always felt like I wanted to be the last place I preached. And I felt like there was something I could do here, something I could help people with. And then I, I felt like when I left Patterson, New Jersey, it was such a place of need you know, in the middle of millions of people. Why would I come to Knoxville, Tennessee? And I wouldn't, but God led me. And I knew God led me, and I had to pray through it. I, I will say this. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. And there's somebody listening to me that I said this to. I have never in 55 years felt like God spoke to me like a bolt from the blue. Um, it was a shocking thing. I just knew that in that second, that split second, I've never been that way. God's dealt with me about things. I've weighed it out, prayed through it. 
wrestled with it, been convinced of it, been not convinced of it, till finally I came to the conclusion. I think there's such a thing as God dealing with a person that way. It's the Lord who said, come, come, let us reason together. And that, that didn't talk about a split-second decision. I don't think the Lord barges into your life and forces himself on you. I think you have to come to conclusions by wrestling with these things. I'm trying to answer all these questions. Uh, how did you know where God wanted you to go and serve him when you came to the Temple Baptist Church? That was quite a trip. I went to the hospital, couldn't walk. I told the Lord in the beginning, I said, I'm not leaving Patterson, New Jersey. And I was foolish enough to tell the people, I'm not leaving Patterson, New Jersey. Because I was so in love with the people and so overcome by the fact that the need was so great that when I had to really... When I had to make a decision that this is where God wanted me to be. And it was still by faith. I didn't weigh out that was a better church or this was a less church. Or Everywhere I've ever gone, Greenback Memorial Baptist Church, then I went to Calvary Baptist Church, then I went to, to a pastor of church in Patterson, New Jersey. I've always gone to a church with fewer people than the church I left. We were running over 800 in Sunday school at Patterson, New Jersey, and I came here, and they had a big day and had 267 people in church here. But I knew it's what God wanted me to do. You see, the real struggle, the real struggle you get through is the wisdom of man, the wisdom of God, the spirit of God, the spirit of man, what you want, what he wants. And uh, you will learn how to deal with those those struggles the question is how do you keep from getting discouraged I don't I just deal with it when I get it I don't think I get, over, get overcome by it but I've had I've had the blessing of having lots of physical problems now man I tell you when I was your age a young man I was tough I was the toughest thing you ever saw in two wheels and uh, I didn't know anybody I couldn't handle and anything I couldn't take care of but God has broken me cut me in half opened me up in the front and the back and uh, lots of things and I have learned to live a different kind of life. But that not, that's not because God was finished with me. It's because God was taking me to another level in my life. And the strength I had to have was not on me. It, it, it was proven that his strength is made perfect in my weakness. Well, I had to become acquainted with my weakness before I could get acquainted with his strength. There's so much I'd like to talk about there and uh, living in weakness as a way of life. Here's a question. What is something you wish you would have known when you first started out as a pastor? Um, I'd have done more about scripture memory. I've done a lot about it, but I mean, when I first started preaching, I memorized everything I preached, every verse. So much so that I, I would just quote the verses. And people start bragging on how much I could quote. And before long, I took a lot of pride in that. And the, the Lord had to deal with me about that. And he did. And then I learned showing people how to find it in the Bible, how to use their Bible was more helpful than me proving what I knew. But I, I think scripture memory is one of the things that you ought to lay a foundation for early in life. Uh, how do you keep from becoming prideful? 
while serving in the ministry. <laughs> well, the Lord takes care of that, you know. Let me tell you a secret. I feel like at this juncture, I've accomplished nothing. I don't, I don't think about what I've done. I think about what I've yet to do, what I have got done, and things I wanted to do. And so the Lord just keeps dealing with those things. Um, how do you determine God's perfect plan from any other plan? Time, mostly. Time. Don't rush. You, you get so rushed when you're young, you think, I've got to get it done. I've got to give everybody an answer. People used to come to me and say, well, i got to know. i got to know today. i got to go now. i got to. Oh, baloney. Just sit still and be quiet. Wait on it. Work through it. Work it out. God, God is never late. He's never early. But we're late. We're early. Wait on him. Um, how do you know that you're in the will of God? I think that's a day-to-day -day thing. I feel like I'm in the will of God today. Trying to serve the Lord today. But I've got a passion on my heart. The passion is to evangelize the small towns in America and to see a generation raised up who give their heart to God, who will attack the devil's territory in the power of God's Holy Spirit like a mighty army. And that's what the Lord's doing. We're praying that way. Now, while I've been talking to you here in this room, I've been talking to men and women all across the country and different places around the world uh, in this Shepherd Summit today. But thank you for joining us, and I hope that this will be a blessing and encouragement to you. I'm going to ask Mr. Zinker to lead us in a closing prayer, okay? Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the things we heard today, how much of a blessing and encouragement they've been to us and a challenge they've been to us. We're thankful for Pastor Sexton. We're thankful for all of these young men today who have answered thy call to preach and be in th thy work. Bless them. Bless everyone who joined today on the Zoom call. And may we trust thee to do a great work. And may the small towns of America be evangelized as we grow close to thee. May we have that burden from thee to do this great work. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.